Hey everybody, all right, so um, let's keep going with our uh, our waves unit and we're gonna we're gonna slowly get into sound uh, but we still have a few more things to talk about and uh, this is a really important idea it's a very big idea we're not going to talk about any math um, we're going to do this from a, a sort of a heuristic point of view um, it's a very important idea it's hugely important in a lot of things okay in terms of how your microwave works how uh, how swings work how everything works in terms of things that go back and forth in a certain way and uh, hopefully you've done the lab okay because the big idea of the lab is actually one of the most important parts of this this idea of resonance and so for our lab what we had said um, the big idea hopefully you got from this was that the frequency the rate at which your pendulum bob went back and forth um, doesn't matter doesn't care sorry about the amplitude okay the frequency is independent of the amplitude All right the faster you push it or the, the, the more you you know more you push the pendulum um, the faster it moved and the more distance it covered and the more distance it covered it you know managed to do it at a faster time so it actually ends up balancing out the, the more you more amplitude you give it the faster it goes and then in the end the time it takes for it to go back and forth doesn't change okay um, this frequency which didn't de depend on amplitude, only depended on one thing, which was the length of our of our pendulum. The mass didn't change. The heavier it is, the, the acceleration will stay the same, right? It's just, it's basically a pendulum is basically a um, a modified falling object. It's a falling object, but there's a tension involved. So we know that accelerating objects fall down at the same rate. So pendulums will fall at the same rate. Their accelerations won't matter. What does change, or what does change the uh, the frequency is the length right? according to that formula that we uh, that we used in our lab and we call this the natural frequency okay? and this is a really important idea even it, I know that's a that's a, a period if you wanted it to be frequency it would be um, a one over this okay um, so it gives us a a quantity that the, the oscillator has that is independent of everything else it's a sort of a natural, the way it behaves, right? Just like a swing on a swing set, um, there's a certain frequency of, or the certain period that it takes for somebody to go back and forth. Okay? And this is hugely important to anything that goes back and forth, whether it's a pendulum or a spring or anything that has what we call a linear restorative force. That sounds like a complicated word, but really it just means that if I increase the displacement or the uh, amplitude or the amount that you push away from an equilibrium point like for example in the, the pendulum the equilibrium point is when it's straight up and down okay that's where it wants to be that's where that's where it wants to just stay uh, when I take it away from that equilibrium point the force that wants it to there's gonna be a force generated that wants it to go back to that that point and it's equal to the amount of extension or the amount of amplitude, the amount of, of, of the angle or, or anything like this. Um, so anything that has what we call a linear restorative force ends up having oscillations, wave-like behavior. It goes back and forth in this periodic way according to sines or cosines or whatever you want, whatever sinusoidal function you want to use here. Okay? So they have linear restorative forces. And what's nice about this is this is a sort of a unifying idea that can connect uh, pendulums, springs, because in a spring, if I compress the spring, the amount of force that's generated in the opposite direction, that's what that negative means here. That's why there's this negative in this formula, that it's a restorative force. It wants to go back to the equilibrium point. All right, I take a spring, it wants, to, it wants to go back to that point. So the more I push it, the more it wants to go back or the same way if I extend it it wants to go back to the original position okay so the more I push it the more the force increases linearly okay I double the extension I double the force I have the extension I have the force okay 
Make sense? It's always backwards. This is a vector equation that no matter how far I, I, whatever direction this is, if it's in the positive direction for a spring, it's going to go backwards to what it was. Or if it's in the negative direction, it's going to go outwards. And what's in, what makes this makes this happen is that it, when it gets back to the equilibrium point, it's gained kinetic energy. Okay, it's we, let's say a spring. We've stored the energy in the spring. We have elastic potential energy. Once it gets to its equilibrium point, it's gained some momentum, some 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 energy, some kinetic energy, and it has to it has that energy, so it keeps going. It misses the equilibrium point, so it ends up actually overshooting the equilibrium so then it has to go back the other way and then it overshoots again and it'll overshoot again and again and again and again and if there's no damping if there's no uh, friction damping is the word for an oscillatory friction friction that acts on things that go back and forth if there's damping it'll slowly it'll go back and eventually it'll reach that equilibrium position that it wants to wants to get to if there was no damping there's some way that you could have an oscillator that had no no losses, no friction along the way. Uh, it would eventually just you know just keep going forever. The energy is lost in the spring. It actually gets warmed up a little bit. Um, also, the thing as it's moving, there's fluid friction from the air. But you can actually see this if you don't believe me. Take an elastic and just m move it back and forth, extend it, stretch it, stretch it a whole bunch, and if you do it a whole bunch, it'll actually feel warm. You're actually um, rearranging the molecules inside of it enough that they're actually gaining some thermal energy. Okay, so we're going to lose some energy here, right? The uh, second law of th thermodynamics, pardon me, uh, always states that we're going to lose energy somewhere. Now, any of these things, uh, they, they could be pendulums, springs, uh, atoms, atoms, like uh, let's say an oxygen molecule is stuck together by a covalent bond. They bounce back and forth as a, a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, water, water waves, you go into a bathtub and you start sloshing back and forth. Uh, the, it'll, the wave will, you know, keep going, it'll overshoot an equilibrium point, and this generates waves. Uh, light is another one that behaves in this way. Uh, the electric fields and magnetic fields that are going at right angles, how do we do this? The magnetic fields and electric fields that are going at right angles to each other in um, electromagnetic radiation behave as waves in the exact same way, okay? So all of these things, this is this beautiful unifying idea that connects anything that has periodic motion has to behave as a having this linear restorative force. And we end up calling these things simple harmonic oscillators. Okay? Uh, simple harmonic motion, SHM, with a you know, simple harmonic oscillator. The harmonic part we'll, we'll talk about and what that means. Um, harmonic series, maybe if you've done 3 you math, this might ring some bells, but maybe not, maybe not. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about what it means in terms of uh, how this is a harmonic series in terms of the, the, the wave solutions that are available. Okay. Now, as I said, these things have natural frequencies, so a simple harmonic oscillator will oscillate at a certain frequency defined by the amount of restorative force and the inertia in the system. Okay, so no matter what, there's always going to be a, some sort of, a, like a... The, the restorative part, like for a spring, for example, there's always going the the k in the spring. This is the the uh, what we call the spring constant of the spring. The larger the spring constant, the stronger the spring. Right? The stiffer the spring, the more the the more difficult it is for me to. For example, like a, a car spring will have an incredibly large k value. It takes a lot of force to compress it a lot. Uh, your slinky. You know, a big slinky has a very small k. It doesn't take any energy at all to start stretching it back and forth. Um, so there's the k value of the spring. And then the m, the more mass you put on the end of the spring, the more inertia it has and the slower the frequency. And there's this square root that we're not going to worry about here, mathematically speaking. Okay. Uh, in the same way, a pendulum, the g, the more gravity there is, the faster it'll swing back and forth. And the longer the string the slower it'll go back and forth. Again, this g is the term that brings it back. It's the inertial part. Sorry, it's the restorative part, the part that wants to, to bring it back into equilibrium. The thing that's bringing a pendulum back into equilibrium is, is just gravity. And the part that gives it in its inertia is the length of the string. The longer the string, it the longer it takes for it to go back and forth. Okay? Uh, you can do actually another one for like a guitar string, for example. The... Um, 
the frequency, this, this is a funny symbol, this omega, this is a, an angular frequency. Uh, so this, uh, for this frequency is going to be equal to the square root of, we need two terms, right? We need a, a term that brings it back, yeah? and the other term is the term that, you know, is the inertia in the system. The thing that brings it back is the tension in the string. Right? It's how much, I mean, this is a funny Greek letter, tau, and the omega, which is the, uh, what we call the, the density of the string. Okay? So the more, the tighter the string is, the faster it will vibrate. If you, like a guitar. If I crank on the guitar, um, the tuning knob, the, the, um, the string tension goes up. And the thicker the string, the more density there is in the string, the higher the frequency will be. Okay. Here, a ukulele here. Okay, so this is a, a string, right? So the thicker the string, this is the thickest string, it has the lowest note, and the thinnest string, I think it's actually this one up here, has the highest note. So the, and if I change the, if I take the tuning peg and I turn it up, increase the tension, the note goes up. Okay, and we can play a nice song here. So uh, again, with a guitar or a ukulele, it's nice ukulele fits in the screen. Guitar didn't fit in my screen here. Uh, the the tau here, remember this is the, in, in terms of this, tau is the tension. Oh, tau is the tension. How much I'm squeezing on the string. And the mu is the, the thickness. I think how much stuff there is in the string. So, here, can you see there? You can't really tell. But that would be the, the lowest string. Okay, this is a, a soprano ukulele, so it goes up there. Okay. So again, so this 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 ukulele behaves in the same way that there's an equilibrium position for the string. But if I ex move it out of that equilibrium position, it wants to go back. From here, so if I take my string and I want to extend it away from it, it wants to go back, but then it overshoots and goes the other way, and then it goes back and forth at you know a very high frequency, something like what's that? That's like 400 hertz or something like that. It's doing that 400 times a second, okay? But again, the the big point, the big idea that I want to get across here is that the frequency does not depend on the amplitude of the oscillation. It only depends on the mechanics of the system okay that's what this is the definition of uh, a simple harmonic oscillator okay now the reason I want to talk about this is because of something the main point of this uh, lesson is resonance so if I now have a system that has a natural frequency and I force it I push on it I do something at the exact same frequency which it wants to vibrate at, then I'm going to increase the amplitude incredibly. I'm going to cause a very, very large increase in amplitude. Okay, this is the idea of resonance. All right? So think of it like on a swing. So this, if you have a kid on a swing, um, there's a certain natural frequency for this for the swing, dependent on the length of the chain. Right? The longer the chain, the lower the frequency. When you're pushing that child to get them to go, or when you're, let's say not you're pushing, let's say you, you're, you're a kid, you're in you know, grade whatever, and you learned how to swing. You learned that you had to move your legs and your body such that you pushed at the right time. If you push at the wrong time, if you just wiggled back and forth quickly, you wouldn't go anywhere. But you're pushing your body at the same frequency. You're changing the, the, your center of mass, basically, at the same frequency in which this the, pen, the the swing would go back and forth. And eventually, you know, you got bigger and bigger, and then you got, you know, a huge amplitude for your oscillation. Okay? This is called resonance. This is a, a very important idea for, for any sort of oscillator. If you push on them at the same frequency, their amplitude increases. Okay? You can do the same thing with a mass on a, on a spring. 
that's a string, sorry, a mass on a spring. If you, if you have a mass on a spring, if you wiggle it too fast compared to its natural frequency, the spring's natural frequency, it won't do anything, it'll just wiggle. If you go up and down, it won't do anything, it won't be able to respond. But if you go up and down at the right time, if you push when it's at the top, right, then you'll just keep pushing it at the right time, increasing the amplitude, increasing the amplitude. Uh, this is the idea of how lasers work. Lasers are just optical resonators. They're uh, little uh, two mirrors back and forth, then the light comes in, and then it goes back and forth in this cavity at the right frequency so that the cavity itself, the space between there, actually resonates optically. Uh, musical instruments do the same thing. Uh, their bodies, this, 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 this guitar here, has the sound that you can hear. That's the natural frequency of the wooden box here. Right? There's a frequency of this box, and so that's why this guitar here has a, a hole inside here and a hollow box. When the sound emanates from the string, it goes into this, this cavity here, and the sound waves go back and forth and actually resonate inside here and are amplified and then come out the sound hole. And it's much louder. If you did, if you had a like an electric guitar, an electric guitar has no resonator. It just picks up the frequencies and amplifies them with a with amplifier. But uh, this this little guy here has its own built amplification because the the body itself, you can hear that note that it's resonating at, and it'll it'll actually. I think maybe clipping on the microphone. Pardon me. Give me a second. You can hear this. There's a certain note, and it wants to resonate at that frequency, and it's it's amplified. Okay, so resonance is an incredibly important idea for any sort of waves. You push the thing at the right frequency, its amplitude increases. Okay. Oh, you've seen the example of breaking a wine glass. Uh, I'm going to link the video on here of uh, where this video actually came from. Um, if you take a wine glass that has a natural frequency, if you hit the wine glass, there's a certain note that it wants to uh, resonate at. Like, for example, my, my coffee cup here. There's that note. And whatever that is, some 2000 hertz or something like that. There's some certain natural frequency that this coffee cup wants to vibrate at. If I now put a speaker next to that, at the right frequency, it, the sound waves, the air, the air here, is gonna push this at the right time, and it's gonna increase and increase the frequency until it actually explodes. You can break a wine glass with your voice. If you were able to, to get your voice to match the frequency of your wine glass. So with resonance, I'm actually able to, to break this wine glass because it has a natural frequency, and I force it at that same natural frequency, the wine glass will break, okay? Um, other examples, oh, sorry, so the whole point here though is these are standing waves, okay? And how standing waves work um, is actually kind of interesting, okay? So let's, let's do this from a, uh, let's do a little graph here, okay? Let's go to Desmos. If I take a wave, let's start it moving, okay? So I'm gonna move this wave to the right. This is just a traveling wave, you know, just doing its thing, just hanging out. And let's assume that it's going to hit some barrier eventually, right? It's in a room. This is sound. It's a uh, something. Who knows? Whatever it is, it's going to hit a, hit a barrier, and it's going to bounce back. And that's going to change the direction of its motion. It won't change the frequency. It won't change the wavelength. Okay, uh, but it'll it'll head back. And as you can see here, there's going to be times where the waves are going to match up and it's going to be a big uh, constructive interference. There's going to be spots where the waves are in the opposite direction, like here, where they're, they're going to cancel out. So what's it going to look like when I add these two waves together? It looks as though the wave isn't moving. It appears like the wave is just going up and down. Let's hide these two for now. As you can see here, the waves are just going up and down. Okay, and there's spots here where nothing moves. We call this a node. Or if this was a sound, for example, we wouldn't hear anything here. And it would be very loud at this constructive interference point. Okay? We're generating a standing wave.
from the interference of those two other waves that we had there, one traveling to the left and one traveling to the right. We put them together, we come up with a standing wave. I've added this, uh, this um, explorer here to the Weebly, so uh, feel free to, to play around with it, okay? So we end up with, pardon me, we, uh, we end up here with nodes and anti-nodes for our, our medium. And notice there's, there's a barrier on this side and a barrier on that side, and it bounces back and forth, and we end up with what we call you know, a standing wave or um, a resonant length in this material, in this, this space. These boundaries define a, um, a resonant length, this is one of them, in this material. Okay, so uh, the, the the space of it, the shape of it, or for example, in a guitar string, the length of the material here, the length from the nut to the bridge here, define a resonant length. I can generate, you know, fundamental frequency, and I can actually generate multiple, sorry, harmonics, where it's vibrating at halves and, sorry, and. Um, Pardon me. Not working too well. There we go. At uh, thirds and quarters. And there's different harmonics that are available. You can actually hear them all. You can put them all together to make our, our sounds that are coming out here. But we'll talk about that later. That's a little bit more than I want to talk about. But all I want to get is that there's certain resonant lengths that exist within a material. Okay? And um, there's actually some good videos here I've, I've linked uh, in the description and on the Weebly and on the Discord. So you can so, sort of see some of these ideas a little bit better, okay? So make sure you watch those. That's actually the homework. Um, again, so here in the shape, here you can actually see uh, these lines that are on this is actually a two-dimensional representation of the standing waves uh, inside here. The lines are where there's no motion. And there's different hertz. This is, this is, these are the different uh, frequencies. Um, Sorry, you can't see those, but those are going up to like 487 for this one. Um, as you can see, the space between them, as the space decreases, the frequency increases. So there's a length here of some centimeters that defines the wavelength of this wave that's resonant within this material. And those are the, wave, the sounds that are picked up and amplified by the resonating box, the sound box of the violin or guitar or whatever device or instrument we're talking about, okay? So all you have to do for homework here is basically watch watch the videos on these links, uh, go to the Explorer and play, okay? Very important idea here in, in terms of waves. Uh, takes, it might take a little while to get your head around the idea. Uh, if you can, if you, you, know, you have a swing at home, go play on a swing. Or you know, if there's a available uh, play structure around, if they're open, if, it's, if you're allowed, I don't think play structures aren't open, are they? So maybe if you have a swing, you know, go or uh, go play on a swing and see see how. Um, try to resonate the swing with the changes of your center of gravity, okay? Uh, and just watch those videos. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this made sense. This is a, a big idea. Um, if you don't get it right away, don't worry about it. Just watch the video again and uh, play with the Desmos Explorer. Uh, play guitar if you have one, and uh, stay safe. All right. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you soon, but who knows? Okay. See you later guys.